Um, and we're going to talk about Rosh Hashanah from a very spiritual perspective. Because when most people, not most people, but oftentimes when people think of Rosh Hashanah, they think of it as a family holiday, you know, a time to get together, a Rosh Hashanah meal with the family, which it is. Don't get me wrong. It, it, that is part of it. But there is so much spiritual meaning in the day that needs to be assessed and needs to be thought over because there, it's something that's unfortunately often overlooked. So I want to explore in depth from a lot of different angles what the deal with Rosh Hashanah is and uh, how we can best apply it to our lives. Sound like fun? Yeah. All right. So sound like fun? If it is, give us a like, a share. Okay. So um, let's start out with a very brief review of some of the things we talked about yet, uh, last week. Last week, we talked about the month of El. We talked about forgiveness. We talked about a time of trying to get back to a sense of purity. We've been talking actually the last two weeks about the concept of El and how its whole entire existence is a time of forgiveness. It's a month of forgiveness. It's a month of making amends, both with other people and with God. And in doing that, it, it, is, a, it is a time where we strengthen our connection uh, with God in, in the same light. And we said that the Hasidic master said about the month of Elul that the king is in the field. And the king in the field means that just like when the president's or the, the candidates are running for office, uh, or the current president when he's uh, trying to re, uh, you know, to to uh, to ha to be reelected. When they when they're on the campaign trail, they're much they're very easily accessible or fairly easily accessible. They put on their polo shirts, they march through the town, they have town hall meetings, they speak in old age homes, and where where they're they're much more easily seen and approached then after the election and after they've been coronated and sworn in, right, then you have to make an appointment with the Secret Service, then you have to go through all sorts of security clearances in order to even get, you know, to shake hands. So the king in the field means, it's an analogy, that in the month of El, it's a special time describing the relationship that we have with God, that God is more accessible to us during that time. Now, God is accessible to us throughout the year, but the month of Elul is a time where within us, we are more motivated. God is closer to us. The inspiration, the impact that God has in our lives is much closer to our heart to do something about it than it is the rest of the year. So it's not that God is any closer or farther away from us now. It's just that our heart is more open to that uh, at this particular time of year. The king is in the field. His closeness is more perceived by us. Okay? And so that's what we've been talking about last week and the week before. Now, we're going to move into Tishrei because the Tishrei is the month of Rosh Hashanah. But before we do that, I want to preface with an interesting idea that we find throughout the Jewish calendar. One of the things that you'll notice if you look on the Jewish calendar if you check out what zodiac sign is corresponding to that Jewish month, you'll find that the sign that is indicated in the secular zodiac actually hints at something that's going on on the Jewish calendar, the energy of that particular month. And it's a very interesting idea. Now, on the secular zodiac or the non-Jewish zodiac on the non-Jewish calendar, you'll find that each sign goes from like mid-month to mid-month. It's, you know, September 3rd, uh, September uh, 15th until October 9th or whatever it is. You know, so on the Jewish calendar, though, each of the Jewish months have a zodiac sign that's associated with it. And each of them are at the same time of year as the non-Jewish zodiac sign it just falls in the, in, the, in the full month. So Kislev is one, Nisan is one, Cheshvan is one. Each month has its own particular energy and its own particular zodiac sign. Now, if you look on the Jewish calendar, 
for what each zodiac sign is for that time of year, one thing you'll find that's interesting is that it corresponds with something that's going on on the Jewish calendar. So first, let's give, a, give an example, right? The very first zodiac sign on the non-Jewish calendar and on the Jewish calendar would be the month of Nisan, right? Which falls, uh, Pesach, that's when Pesach falls, it's the month, uh, spring month. Now, the zodiac sign that's associated with Nisan is the sign of Aries, right? The ram, or the lamb. Now, if you think about Pesach, if you think about Passover, and you think about Aries, the lamb, the ram, what is the connection between the two? Well, so many people would say, which I'm saying, the Korban Pesach, the Passover offering. Right, the, the lamb's blood that was put on the door and before the Jews went out of Egypt, and the, the, the sacrifice that was offered every single year when the, when the temple stood. So there's a clear correlation between what the sign is on the zodiac to what's taking place that particular time of year. And the truth of the matter is, is that it, that, that you find throughout the Jewish calendar, whatever is being discussed, uh, whatever, whatever theme is present in the Jewish month spiritually is also taking place on the Jewish calendar in the zodiac sign. So the zodiac sign for the month of Elul, right, the, the month that we're currently in, is Virgo. Virgo, the symbol of Virgo, the, the character of Virgo is the Virgin. Right? Virgo is the Virgin. And so the idea of Virgo this month, the Virgin, Virgin is a symbol of purity. The idea of hasn't been tainted, hasn't been. And so the idea of the month of Elul, which is symbolized by the zodiac sign Virgo, is the idea of returning to purity. That it's a time of year in which, because we're making amends and because there's, it's a time of forgiveness, that it's a time where we are, we are trying to get back to that place in ourselves that is pure that soul deep within us, sometimes it's buried very deep amongst muck and garbage, but that diamond that's there, we want to try to get back, dig down to that place of pristine purity. And that's the idea why, why Virgo is the symbol uh, and the sign, the zodiac sign associated with the month of El. Now, when we move into Tishrei, which is the, the, which is the month where we find Rosh Hashanah, where we find Yom Kippur, where we find Sukkot, all of the holidays that we're about to that are about to bombard us, the month of Tishrei is symbolized by the zodiac symbol Libra. Now, what is the symbol Libra? Right, the scales of justice. Now, any idea why that would be? What that? What does that have to do with Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, right? Sukkot is because the month of Tishrei is the month where God is judging the world, right? Rosh Hashanah, in fact, is called Yom Hadin, the day of judgment, right? It's the day where God judges the world, right? Like Terminator 2, judgment day, right? So Rosh Hashanah is very much like Terminator 2. It's judgment day, where God judges the world. God judges each individual, right? We, like we say in the, the Nisan Atoykev prayer, right? Who shall live and who shall die and who shall prosper? All the details that happen to a person are judged on Rosh Hashanah. Same with Yom Kippur is, is it the day of atonement, but that whole period between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is a time where, again, the scales of justice are being weighed. And if a person was judged a certain way on Rosh Hashanah, that's not sealed until Yom Kippur. Right? And as the month continues, as the month of Tishrei continues, the final, final ceiling is after Sukkot. So the whole month of Tishrei really is a time of divine judgment, a time where the scales of justice are being weighed in our favor. And so this is why, once again, you'll find that the month of Tishrei, beginning with Rosh Hashanah, is symbolized by the zodiac sign Libra, the scales of justice. So we find that throughout the Jewish year, and let's use that as the starting premise for our discussion about not only Rosh Hashanah, but Tishrei as we begin the month of Tishrei. Now, some of the basics of the month of Tishrei. Now, it is the seventh month in the Jewish calendar. Jews are the only ones that can have 
a first month of the months and a first month of the years. So the first month of the months is marked from when the Jews left Egypt in Nisan. So the first month is Nisan, right? A few months ago, Passover time. And so Tishrei, month of Rosh Hashanah, is considered the seventh month. But it's also the month where we begin a new year. So if you're counting from when the new year starts, Tishrei is the first month of the year. It's, it's all, it's only Jews could come up with such a system. So Tishrei, being the seventh month of the year, is called in some text Yerach Ha'esanim, the strong month. And it's a month where God grants us extra strength in order to accomplish what we need to accomplish. And not only that, not only being a month of strength in accomplishing what we need to accomplish, but also the, the fact that it's the seventh month of the year, uh, seven we've, we've mentioned many times is an extraordinarily significant number. That seven is the completion of everything in the natural world. That's why there are seven days in a week, right? The system of time has been, has been separated into seven days. And we find that the continents are divided up into seven. We find that the music scale is divided up into seven. We find that the light spectrum, right, the colors of the rainbow, are Roy G. Biff, right, seven. So all across the board, when you want to talk about completion in the natural order of things, seven is the month that, seven is the, is the number that is used to represent that. And so the seventh month of the year is a time of completion. So not only is it a month of strength, Yerach HaEsanim, right, it is also a time of completion, right? This is where we are complete in our in our strength. We are complete in our uh, judgment. This is the month of completion. Tishrei is also uh, an Aramaic word, which means to release. And what happens during the month of Tishrei, being that it's Aramaic, uh, being being that it means to release, it means that God releases us during that month to all of our accrued transgressions of the year throughout the year. Through, through many things that we may have done, we accrue a spiritual baggage, emotional baggage, spiritual baggage, and this drags us, we drag it along with us like a ball and chain, and when we want to connect with God, this is sort of baggage that we're dragging along with us. So uh, Tishrei, being the month of release, where, where in Aramaic it means to release, God is releasing us from all the accrued transgressions and baggage of the year. So any spiritual uh, bounds of attaining a spiritual experience with God are alleviated for us in the month of Tishrei, right, beginning with Rosh Hashanah. In fact, the word Tishrei, and this is a very interesting way to think about it, right, the word Tishrei in Hebrew is spelled Tuf, Shin, Resh, Yud. Now, in the Hebrew alphabet, Tuf is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Shin is the second to last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Resh is the third to last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, all the way back to Yud. Now, the idea is, the idea that the, the, the name itself conveys is that even someone who throughout the course of the year has fallen all the way to the top, gone all, fallen all the way to the end of the alphabet, all the way to the top, can slowly climb their way back in the month of Tishrei. They can move from the Toph to the Shin, from the Shin to the Resh, from the Resh all the way back to the Yud, which symbolizes the name of God. So even someone who has fallen all the way down over the course of the year, Tishrei is the time where they can begin picking themselves up. Tishrei empowers a person to be able to do that. And so step by step, a person who has fallen can reach to, towards Hashem. Now, Rosh Hashanah, the word Rosh Hashanah, right, Rosh Hashanah, means head of the year. We don't call it Tchilas Hashanah, the beginning of the year. We don't call it Shana Hadasha, the new year. We call it Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. And the idea, the symbolism behind that, that's discussed in Hasidic and Kabbalistic literature, we call it the Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, because just like the head controls the body, just like the head controls all of the details of what happens in a body, this day affects every bit of the entire year coming up. 
It is the head. It is the nucleus of the whole year coming up. Rosh Hashanah, what it celebrates, like what historically happened on Rosh Hashanah, why does Rosh Hashanah fall the day that it falls? Rosh Hashanah is the day that Adam and Eve were created. Mankind was created on Rosh Hashanah, right? And if you think about it, even though in the prayers of Rosh Hashanah we say today is the birthday of the world, we don't mark the birthday of the world from the day that the world was created, from when the universe was created. We say the birthday of the world is when humanity is created. And that's a very interesting thing because mankind is the entire purpose of creation. Everything else in the world, in fact, everything else in the universe, we could say is a backdrop for the mission of humanity in this world. And it's a fascinating idea. Humanity, human beings were given free will. We were the only creatures in the universe to be given free will. And so the whole purpose that God created the universe for was to create a forum, to create a system where individuals would have free will. And even though they are placed in an atmosphere, in, in, in a realm that conceals godliness, that they'd be able to see through that veil, choose the godly path, and reveal godliness, spirituality, in a place that was created to conceal spirituality. So that even the place that was meant to hide God would be a place that would reveal God. And that can only be done through a free-willed being. It's the whole purpose of this entire universe. The whole reason God created the world, according to the capitalists. And so humanity, who is the being, the creature that has free will, is the central purpose of this entire creation. And that means everything else in creation is somewhat of a backdrop. It's just not decoration, but meant to help facilitate humanity to do its mission in the world. And so, right? this is the birthday of the world, this is the beginning of your work, is not from the day that creation started, not from let there be light, but from the day that Adam and Eve, the human beings, were created. Because that's the first day that the mission, that the purpose of the world was implemented. It's interesting that, well, one of the things that we find by humanity is that humanity, humans, were created on an individual scale. Everything else in creation is created as a whole. So when God said, let there be light, right, light comes. And God says, let there be sun, moon, and stars, and all the stars come in the universe. God says, let there be plants, and all the plants come about. God says, let there be animals, and all the animals come about. It doesn't say God said, let there be humans, and all the humans came about, though. Human beings were created as an individual. As an individual. And the reason that human beings were created as an individual, one of the reasons that they were created as an individual, is that each human being, as an individual, should say to themselves that this whole world is worthy of being created just for me. Bishvili nivra ha'olam. This whole world was created for my sake. Now some people, a lot of Israelis live like that, right? They just push you out of line, right? But, um, but the way that it's meant to be understood, right, that the world was created for me, meaning that I am the only one that can contribute a certain thing. I was created for a unique purpose that no one else who has ever lived and ever will live is able to accomplish in this world. Right? The package of talents and personality traits and passions and everything that I'm able to do in the combination that I was given, in the place and time and everything that I was put in, only I can elevate that segment of the world. Not only in this time, but in all times. We have a very important mission that no one else can do for you. And so when we say it's worth that the world was created for me, not that you're the most special person in the world, but only you can do your job in the world. And so God created human beings individually, stressing the point that each individual human has a specific purpose, a specific uh, mission in this world. Right? Animals and plants are created as one whole because... Again, they're only facilitating the mission of the human being. But each human being as an individual 
is distinct and unique for a specific mission in this world. About that, everyone, our connection got interrupted, but we are here talking about Rosh Hashanah and the month of Tishrei, and we're saying that the whole world being created for you is, what that means is that humanity was created on an individual level, right? Adam and Eve were created alone, in dis distinct from the animals who were created as one whole, the plants that were created as one whole, human beings were created as individuals, to stress the point that each individual has a unique mission and it's worth that the whole world be created for your particular mission, that only you can do that mission in the world. Not anybody else who has ever lived or ever will live, you are the only one that can elevate your segment in the world. Okay, so again, Rosh Hashanah celebrates the birthday of Adam and Eve, the creation of Adam and Eve. And the objective to, uh, of mankind is to do God's mission in the world, to make the world a dwelling place for God. That this world which conceals godliness, right, a physical world which conceals godliness, should that should be a place that reveals godliness. And that's only done through human free choice. And so this is the objective that's initiated on Rosh Hashanah. Every year we re-celebrate that mission. God's charge of doing mitzvahs, doing commandments, uplifting the world through doing what God says to do. The only way that we uplift the world is through doing what God says. We can't just make up whatever we want and say, oh, I'm uplifting the world through what I feel is the right thing. How do we know what, we're, what we want is the right thing? So God tells us very specifically, this is how you uplift the world. These are the commandments you got to do. That's how you'll uplift the world. And so every year on the birthday of humanity, the birthday of Adam and Eve, we re-celebrate that mission. We get reacquainted and reaffirm that mission, that we have a job to do in this world. We have commandments that need to perform, that need to be performed. And what, what Rosh Hashanah is, is we crown God as king in our life. That's how we re-celebrate this mission. Because there are no such things as commandments unless you acknowledge that there's a commander. So in order to embark on doing commandments, the very first thing a person has to realize is that there's a commander who has, who has commanded these things. And so Rosh Hashanah, the day where we, again, we are uh, we we're renewing our connection with our mission, the very first step is reaccepting God as commander of our life, as our commander, as our king. On Rosh Hashanah, the main mitzvah of the day is the sounding of the shofar. And the sounding of the shofar uh, is done with a ram's horn. And this ram's horn actually symbolizes the akedah, the, the sacrifice that, that Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar for God, what, what God had instructed him to do. Just Abraham's willingness to do that that embedded spiritually in all of Jews throughout the rest of time, the worthiness to be forgiven and to be judged favorably. Like Abraham's one action set, well, Abraham's many actions, but Abraham's action of the Akedah finished and, and bequeathed a spiritual sort of uh, virtue within all the Jewish people throughout the rest of history that we be worthy of being forgiven, that we be worthy of uh, having God as king in our life, that was achieved through the Akedah, through Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac. And therefore, when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, when we are uh, remembering our mission, we do it through the sounding of the shofar, because our worthiness of crowning God king and our worthiness of being forgiven is achieved through the what was, was bequeathed to us through Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac. Also, it's interesting, the shape of the shofar, where on one end, the end that we blow, uh, it's, it's very narrow, whereas the other end that, that kind of points in the air is very wide. And that's symbolic of the idea that humanity, from our vantage point, where we put the effort in, we have a very narrow constraint. We have very, uh, a very... Um, Small, like tunnel vision. We have a very, we're very limited in our vision and are very limited in our abilities. But when we call out to God from our straits, from our limitations, God responds on the other end with abundance. 
God has tremendous abundance on the other end. So crowning God as king is accomplished through the shofar. When we blow air into the shofar, make the sounds accordingly, we are collectively crowning God as king in our life. That is symbolic of, I'm saying, God, I want you to be king in my life. And that's what we're doing on Rosh Hashanah. Now, the simple way of looking at that is just like when a king is inaugurated or coronated, right? You sound the trumpets, and that's do to do, right? That's the, the king comes out, sound the trumpets, and that's what we're doing through sounding the shofar. But on a deeper level, the, the idea of this sound, of the sounds of the shofar, the, the cries of the shofar, if you will, are sort of a wordless appeal of the soul yearning for its source. It pleads forgiveness and pleads to be united with Hashem, our soul, on a deep level, that groan, that cry. Words are limited and can't convey the depth of emotion. You know, there are, in, in, the, in, in the Hasidic circles, nigunim, songs, wordless songs, are considered extraordinarily spiritual and uplifting. Because sometimes words themselves can be limited. You know, you can't compare someone expressing emotion even without words. Right? They just like say a picture is worth a thousand words. Emotions, a, a grunt, a sigh, a yearning, is, is not something that can be conveyed in words um, properly. So this sound of the shofar is the soul crying out, desperately wanting to return to God, desperately wanting to coronate God as king and be connected in a new way. And it's interesting, if you think about it, the idea of the shofar, this is a very deep idea. So uh, maybe some of you won't get it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, the idea of why, why is the main mitzvah blowing the shofar on, on Rosh Hashanah, where, where, does, where does this, how is this the, the, the marking of reestablishing our mission in the world? If you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense. It's really interesting. So one of the differences in the way in which humanity was created to the way in which everything else in creation was created is that everything else in creation was created through divine speech. God said, let there be light. God said, let there be sun, moon, and stars. God said, let there be plants and animals, right? When it comes to human beings, it says God formed the human from the dust of the earth, and then what? Blew the breath of life into the human being. Blew the, blew the breath of life. And the, the difference in the symbolism is that when you speak, the air expenditure that comes out is very superficial. A person can talk and talk and talk forever, never gets tired, because when you speak, it's just superficial air that's in your mouth. But when you take deep breaths, it comes from a much deeper place. You can't do that. You, you get tired after five minutes of taking deep breaths, inhale and exhale. And the idea is that when God blows the breath of life into humanity, that symbolizes that God has a much more essential, much deeper connection with humanity than God does with everything else in creation. So God blows the breath of life into Adam and Eve. And when we, it's, there should be therefore no surprise that when we're commemorating and we're sort of renewing our connection with God, uh, renewing our mission with God, that the mitzvah, the commandment that we do to demonstrate that involves blowing, involves blowing air with deep breath. And one of the things that are, that are talked about by some of the commentaries, the Avni Nezer in particular, says that when a person, when the community, when the shofar is blown, at that moment, there is a new soul blown into each person fulfilling that mitzvah. That it causes, it's like a, a reciprocal system, that through us blowing the shofar down here, there is a new soul of life, a rejuvenating force that is blown into each and every one of us. Not that we have a new soul, so to speak, but that there is a new life, there is a new energy, there, we are rejuvenated. So we're taught 
that God creates the world at every moment. That God didn't just create the world at the beginning of creation and then it sort of runs on autopilot in the way that most people think about the way that God created the world, right? That's sort of like a deistic mentality that God sort of created the universe and then sort of let it run on autopilot. Right? He went to go do other things. But God is actively invested in our world, right? The whole Torah attests to that idea that we believe in a theistic God who is involved in history, that God is involved in every moment of our lives. God is the God who took us out of the land of Egypt. God is the God who's invested in what's going on in our lives, in our world. And so God, uh, God continuously creates the world at every moment. So it's not that God uh, created the world and now it runs on autopilot. That God actually creates everything one moment after the next, constantly creating. And if God were to stop creating for one moment, the world would just revert back to nothing and cease to exist. And so every year, God utilizes a new energy, a, a better energy, to use to create this world, right? So qualitatively, every year, there's a better energy that God uses in order to keep this, this show going, right? that God utilizes to, uh, to, to make this world uh, actually exist. So one of the things that it says is that that energy uh, is, is the same energy that's used at every moment for the course of a year, right? But then when Rosh Hashanah comes and it's a new year, God has to sort of be re-aroused to be king over the universe. And that's up to us. Through the blowing of the shofar, through blowing of the air and the proper calls of the shofar, we reawaken God's desire to be king because God sees, okay, my people are willing to commit to their mission, so I'm willing once more to be king over them. We have to want it. There's no king without a nation. You can't just declare yourself king in the desert. So until the nation, until the nation says we want a king, and they do that symbolically through blowing the sounds of the shofar, until that happens, God's desire to awaken and be king once more is sort of on hold. So one of the things that it says is that when Rosh Hashanah comes, but before the shofar is blown, Kabbalistically, it says that the world is sort of only existing on fumes, right? Because God's desire to be king once more hasn't been aroused yet, hasn't been awakened yet. The shofar hasn't been blown yet. And so until that happens, the world is sort of existing on fumes. Now, God creates the world at every moment. It's sort of like, if you think about it, it's like a movie projector. Right? The way the movies, I don't know how they work today, but they used to work, right? They have this long strip of film and the, the, the light bulb, you know, is shining and it, you know, it shines the big picture. So this world, you can think about it as a movie projector. That at every moment there's, that every moment it, it, there's another cell, you know, that's be, another film cell that is being, uh, you know, flown by. And that's what makes, you know, creation sort of exist in the way that it does. And... The, the light, let's use that analogy, as the, the energy that God is using in order to project this image of the world that we, that we see. And so every year, God sort of changes the light bulb that's being used to express you know, the film that comes out and the picture that's being seen. So every year, there's a qualitatively better energy that's being used to recreate the world at every moment. And so that happens, that begins every year, starting on Rosh Hashanah. So every year, there is a new and superior light, a new and superior energy being invested in the world. It's a time of renewal. It's a time of starting over. Um, and I was just talking to my wife. I said, kind of looking forward to Rosh Hashanah because I need some new energy in the world. I need some new energy in my life. I need some new, uh, you know, uh, new light, new, new start off fresh. So... And, and that's exactly what takes place beginning Rosh Hashanah. Now, uh, we, so we have to remember that coming up this Sunday night, there's a new qualitatively superior light about to enter the world that will keep everything in existence, right? The world as it will exist Sunday night on is different qualitatively than the world as it exists now. It's a whole different existence, like we're living in a different dimension. So... 
there are other customs that I wanted to at least touch on uh, to just talk conceptually about some of the things of Rosh Hashanah. So there's a custom on Rosh Hashanah to eat apples and honey, right? To dip the apple, but it's not a mitzvah, but it's one of the customs that are done. I don't want to talk about the symbolism of it because it's a inter really interesting idea. So the symbolism of the apple and the honey, you think we say that, you know, dip, la dip, dip the apple and the honey, and that symbolizes, right, God giving us a, a hope for a sweet new year. Okay, so sweet is the honey. Where does the apple come in? Right, why not dip the banana in the honey, or dip the kiwi in the honey, or dip, you know, dip the watermelon in the honey? Why is it specifically the apple? And so one of the reasons that's discussed, the apple is a very significant fruit. The Talmud says something very interesting in the apple. The Gemara and Shabbos says that the apple tree is distinct from other types of trees. The apple tree produces fruit before its leaves sprout. So on most trees, first the leaves sprout and then the fruit comes out. On the apple tree, first the fruit comes, then the leaves sprout. It's like the opposite. And so the Jews are compared to the apple. In fact, the Jews in Tanakh, in the Bible, are called the apple of God's eye. Why the apple of God's eye? Why not the banana of God's eye? Right? It, it makes just as much sense. Why are you the apple of my eye? Why, why does that make sense? We don't laugh at that, but like if you say you're the banana of my eye, right? So the idea is that the Jewish nation is kind of like the apple. It's kind of like the opposite of logical sense. And I've met a lot of Jews. I can attest to that completely. But what we're talking about here is the Jews' willingness to accept the Torah. Because the normal way that the world goes, and the way that the Talmud says when the Torah was offered to the nations of the world, they approached it in the normal way. Let's see what's in it, and then we'll decide if we want to accept it or not. What happened when God brought the Torah to the Jews? Naseh. We'll take it, we'll accept it, and then we'll understand exactly what's inside. Then we'll get the details of it. But first we'll accept, and then we'll get the details. That's not the natural order of things. So ever since the Jews accepted the Torah in that fashion, sort of the opposite of the way logic would dictate, the opposite of the way that the other nations approached it, after that, after that, there was, uh, the, the Jews from that point on were, uh, were treated in the opposite fashion as logic would dictate. So that, that applies across the board. In fact, the Torah theology, right, Torah thought stresses this point in many, in many ways. God says that he gives the cure before he gives the illness. Uh, according to logic, if a person wants to have more money in their bank account, Right? They should do their much, as much as they can to squander, to save the money. Right? God tells us that if, you're, if you give, if you're giving a person, God will bless you with even more money. It's counterintuitive. The more I'm going to give, the more God's going to give me, the more I'm going to get back. So if I want to make money, I've got to give money. It's counterintuitive, but this is the system of how the Torah works. And so the Torah system works sort of like the opposite. And so since the Jewish people, through accepting the Torah in the opposite way, we are compared to the apple, the apple of God's eye. And this is why we dip the apple in the honey. We wish the Jewish nation to have a sweet, and a good and sweet New Year. It's interesting that, uh, you know, a bee has kind of two opposites. On the one hand, there's a stinger, right? On the one hand, a bee has a stinger, but on the other, on the other hand, bees produce honey which is sweet. So there's the sting and the sweet. So we're asking God as well that we ask for sweetness and not no stingers, right? We're asking God for the sweetness and that, that there should be no harsh judgment uh, coming along with them. In fact, when we, when we eat the apple, we say, Lushana tova umetuka, right? It should be a good and sweet new year. Right? Good and sweet. Not just good in the theoretical sense that everything God does is for the good, but good and sweet, a, a good that in a way that we can appreciate it, a good that we find there's a certain sweetness and a certain pleasure that is in the good. Not just some, obs some obscure good, some direct good. Uh, another custom, some people eat pomegranate. 
uh, Rosh Hashanah. Contrary to popular belief, uh, a pomegranate does not have 613 seeds. There is an expression uh, in the Talmud that uh, every Jew is full of mitzvahs like a pomegranate is full of seeds. So some people think, well, since there's 613 mitzvahs, there must be 613 seeds. That's not the imagery that is being conveyed. The imagery is that just like when you open up a, a pomegranate, you're like, wow, a lot of seeds. Right? So too, every Jew, if you open them up, they're full of mitzvahs. One last custom uh, before we end the night is the, the custom of tashlich. Very interesting custom, somewhat, somewhat mystical custom. So tashlich is where you go out to uh, you know, a place where there's running water, you see flowing water, it could be a river, whatever it is. You, it tends to be a place also, you're supposed to look for a place that has fish in it as well. And you go out there and you, there's a, you know, a, a few paragraphs that you read. And the idea is, tashlich means to, to, to send, right? Is the idea is that you're picturing yourself throwing all of your sins, all of your lackings into the water, right? Casting it into the sea. Now, why, why would we want to convey the imagery of throwing them into the water? Why not do something even, perhaps even more effective? Why don't we make a bonfire and cast off all our sins into the fire, right? Destroy them completely. Just leave them ash, destroy them. What, when you throw something in the water, it's, it's still there. It's just in the water, right? If you want to really destroy it, you want to really eradicate it, throw it into the fire. And so one of the interesting ideas, there's, there's a concept in the, in the Talmud. The Gemara says in, in Avaida Zara, the, the tractate Avaida Zara, that, that every animal that exists on the land Every non-kosher animal taste that exists on the land has a kosher animal taste, a corresponding kosher animal taste, in the sea. What that means is that pork, you know, pig is a, is a land animal, it's not kosher, but the taste of pork, and I don't know exactly what fish it is, right? There's, there is a, they say that it's the, the shibuta fish, right? I don't know exactly what fish that is, though. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that it's one that's current. I don't think it's one that's currently in existence that we know about, but it is kosher and it's in the sea. And the, the taste of that fish is the same as pork. So every land animal that has a non-kosher taste has a corresponding kosher animal with that same taste in the water. And so the symbolism of the water is that water has the ability to cleanse the unclean and purify it. So when a person sins, they, the, the, the idea is that the sin itself shouldn't be something that's destroyed, per se, but it should be a force that galvanizes a catalyst for teshuva. It should be something that's transformed into good. That the sin that a person did, that should be maybe the starting point of a person making their life better. Sometimes... You know, they say in the addiction world, until the person hits rock bottom, that that rock bottom, until they hit that rock bottom, that's when they started doing the right thing. That's when they started, I got to clean up my act over here. I got to start making things better over here. And so the, the, this idea of throwing our sins into the water, casting them into the water, is not that we want to destroy them completely, but it's symbolic that this should be a catalyst so we're starting to do the right thing. I'm not trying to destroy my to destroy my sin. I remember them and I'm using them as a catalyst to purify myself. The idea of the, the fish being in the water, right? Going to a place where there's fish. So the fish were the first creation in the animal kingdom. Right? The fish came first in the animals. Right? And they were also the first creature to be blessed, be fruitful and multiply. Fish and humans, be fruitful and multiply. Now, the flowing waters that we go out to remind us of the cleansing, um, cleansing the remains of the past. And the fish remind us to fruitfully express all that's contained within us. That's why we go specifically to a place where there's, where there's fish. 
Well, another thing that we have to remember is that during the Akedah, during the time where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, one of the things that the commentaries say is that the Satan, right, the, the enemy, the forces of evil, right, Satan, uh, created a mirage of a river. Like he was trying to stop them from going up the mountain. And so he created this, this image of a river, but they recognized, they were able to see past it, they saw through the illusion, were determined to carry out their journey and just walk right through it. So Tashlich reminds us, going out to the river reminds us to be like Abraham and recognize that most of our obstacles are illusionary. Right? There's, and they're also strategically placed there to push us to newer and greater levels. So with this in mind, right, I would like to conclude with one of my favorite stories. I tell it every year. And it's the way in which a person is meant to make a New Year's resolution. Rosh Hashanah, when it comes to, um, when it comes to New Year, everyone thinks about you know, starting something new. And so there's a great story of, of a woman with a very poor family. And poor 300 years ago didn't mean that you go on a five-day vacation instead of a 10-day vacation. Poor back then meant you got to figure out how you're going to put food on your table that night. And so this woman was very excited because she found herself, she got herself a hold of an egg. And so she came home, and that meant there was going to be dinner that night. She gathered the children around. And as she was about to cook the egg, right, she starts getting very excited. She says, wait a second. Instead of taking this egg and eating it now, let's hold off. Let's wait, and we'll hatch the egg. Then, not only will we have an egg, we'll have a chicken that can produce many eggs. And she got even more excited. She said, and then when the chicken produces all of these eggs, we can hatch those chickens and have more chickens and produce lots of eggs, a whole barn full of eggs. And then maybe we can trade some of the chickens for a goat and have milk and a goat and chickens and eggs. And then we can trade some more chickens and some milk and a goat for more goats and for a cow. And, for, and, and she got so excited that they're going to have chickens and eggs and cows and a whole barn full of things. She got so excited that she dropped the egg and it splattered all over the floor. And there was no dinner to be eaten. And that's exactly the way in which a lot of people make a New Year's resolution. They start off saying, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start going to the gym. Not only am I going to start going to the gym, I'm going to start eating right. Well, if I'm going to start eating right, i got to also, do, you know, they, they pile on all of these things. If I'm going to start eating right, i got to start waking up on time. If I'm going to start waking up on time, that means I got, and, and they, have, they construct this whole picture that they're going to rearrange their entire life. And then by the third day, splattered on the floor. So the idea of Rosh Hashanah is taking the egg, taking one very particular, very specific thing, saying, let's integrate this into my life. Let's bring this into my year. It's very practical. It's very doable. Better one small thing that you can know that you're going to keep than creating this whole massive project for yourself that the chances of actually upholding it are, are, very, are very unlikely. So this is the message of Rosh Hashanah. And when this new light that is coming to all of our lives hits us on Sunday night, this year, we should all be blessed and written and inscribed for a good and sweet year, be able to carry through and bring it down home with a New Year's resolution that improves our lives. And God willing, next time we get together, it'll be with a whole new force, a whole new energy, and we'll see you then. Have a great night and Shana Tova. How did Noah protect himself from the tumultuous flood? By coming into the ark. In Hebrew, the word teva means both ark and word. And by you and I delving into the words of Torah, we too are saved and protected from the tumultuous and catastrophic events that happen throughout our lives. The ARC online learning program is your opportunity, no matter what your religious background is, to delve into Torah in a thorough and clear way with a rabbi. Now, you don't have a lot of time. You're dealing with work. You're dealing with the kids. You're dealing with all sorts of stuff. That's why we've condensed every day's lesson into 15 minutes. Plus, you'll have access to all the back archives and access to the rabbi. So anytime you can learn at your own pace and whatever time you choose. 
I hope that you'll sign up for the ARC today. If you have any questions about it, just comment below. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing all of you on board the ARC today. Everyone, welcome back for another exciting evening tonight. We're going